Rian, voy a repetir. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 28th Annual International Business Forum, being organized, as always, under the umbrella of the Global Business Alliance of New England. The Alliance is a collaborative effort of business associations and agencies in this state involved in international trade. For more details, please visit our website, gbane.org. My name is Ursula Wojciechowska, and I'm the chair of this initiative. This year's forum will be focusing on climate change and implications for international business. We have a very busy program ahead of us today, so we ask you please to put your questions for the speakers in the chat option at the bottom of your screens. This program is being recorded and will be available on the GBAIN YouTube channel next week. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a very special thanks to Emily, Executive Director of the German American Business Council, and Udvine, Executive Director of the French American Chamber of Commerce, for the help in organizing this event. It's been a pleasure, ladies, working with you both. And to David Fox, photographer, who's taken some virtual pictures for us today. In closing, a thanks also to our presenting sponsor, Bakovic, Mayotte and Singer, represented by Ken Bakovic, founding partners. Good to have you with us again, Ken. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, it's always good to be here at a GBN event. Um, unfortunately, we're not in, together in one place like we usually are, but hopefully next year we'll be doing that. And uh, thank you, Ursula, for pulling together this uh, great panel today and the great presenters. This is going to be a very interesting, very interesting day. Uh, my uh, honor is to introduce Dr. Michael Goodman. Uh, Michael's been with us now for a number of years and is always a uh, one of our top presenters at these programs. Um, Michael is a senior advisor to the Chancellor for Economic Development and Strategic Initiatives and Professor of Public Policy at UMass Dartmouth. Professor Goodman is a leading analyst of the Massachusetts economy and has authored or co-authored over 50 professional publications on a wide range of public policy issues, including regional economic development and housing policy as well, as demographic and other applied social science topics. I'm looking forward to Michael's discussion about what's happening here in Massachusetts, and I think he'll touch a little bit on the rest of the world also. So Michael, with that, it's all yours, and thank you for being here today. My great pleasure, Kenneth. Always nice to be back. Uh, this is a wonderful tradition, and I share your hope that we'll be able to do it together all in person uh, next year. I'm going to uh, try to tee up this wonderful and very timely conversation about the implications of climate conditions for business and uh, international trade by offering my perspective on the state of the state economy, the regional economy, in the context of uh, you know the evolving global economy as well, I approach this topic as a as a member of our faculty here at UMass Dartmouth, a, an editor of uh, the journal Mass Benchmarks, produced by the University of Massachusetts in Amherst with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, and as someone who thinks about regional economic conditions uh, quite a lot, um, I'll speak briefly in an effort to highlight, I think, a few major conditions that are weighing fairly heavily on the economic outlook and can help to explain where we are uh, in economic terms here in Massachusetts and New England in particular. Um, if we take a look at the tail of the tape, that is the rate of growth of the United States as compared to the rate of growth of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where we are today, you can see we've been through quite a rough road. We've all lived through it together over the pandemic period. But if we look back uh, between 2020 and 2021, we've seen a fairly uh, um, unprecedented drop that second quarter of 2020. We dropped by a, a greater uh, at a greater pace than uh, in our recorded history, both at the national level and here in Massachusetts. Mass Benchmarks, the journal I referred to earlier, uh, has a real-time economic indicator that tracks the growth uh, and is uh, where that information comes from for the state. Of course, the U.S. Department of Commerce and their gross domestic product 
in income accounts tracks the rate of growth for the U.S. So we had as, as big a drop as we've ever had before in our history in the second quarter uh, and as large a recovery as we have. But, you know, for for because the base was that much smaller, the rate of growth in the third quarter did not actually put us back above where we had started at the peak uh, pre-pandemic recession, and that would be February of 2020. So we've been able to crawl back by by growing, as you can see, um, um, after that meteoric rise in the third quarter of 2020 at a more uh, stable pace, although in historical terms, I think it's been a quite robust recovery. This tells the story of our economic growth um, but if we if we look at our uh, at our job growth, you can see that um, as compared to the so-called Great Recession in 2009, where, as you may recall, we had a uh, catastrophic global financial crisis and housing market declined, followed by a very slow recovery. Even though we've bounced back very robustly, as the last chart highlighted, in terms of job recovery, we're still, as of December, here in Massachusetts, about 150,000 jobs below where we started in February 20, which is still about as worse uh, the, uh, as, as it was in the worst of that so-called Great Recession. And so uh, I think it, there's a bit of a different story this time. As you can see, the slope of these lines are very different with a much stronger pace of job growth coming out of this latest recession as compared to the one in 2009. But I think it's important to keep in context, even though I think economic conditions from a variety of perspectives, both regionally and nationally, um, are, are well position us well for growth, we're still digging ourselves out of a, an extraordinarily deep economic hole uh, that was the result of an extraordinary series of steps, I think appropriate steps, that were taken nationally and particularly at the state level to cope with the uh, incredible public health challenge that we faced, particularly in the spring of 2020, but certainly to varying degrees uh, ever since. We more or less put the economy at that time uh, in a state of suspended animation. And uh, I've, I've said elsewhere, and I'll say again, that this was the equivalent of a, mid, uh, a physician putting the patient into a medically induced coma, something that you could never imagine doing unless the alternative was worse. And I think uh, our policymakers did the right thing, uh, but the recovery from that uh, state of suspended animation, if you will, uh, has taken a bit longer than some may have anticipated. And I think we can expect to be in recovery mode for much of the current calendar year. Um, the, the experience of our leading employers, and this is Massachusetts and some really important data that the Boston Foundation tracks through its indicators project, you can see that the sectors, uh, and this is pretty intuitive, that were hit hardest and first uh, were the ones that involve lots of frontline work, particularly face-to-face -face interaction, uh, personal and business tourism and travel um, interactions in uh, hospitality settings. Uh, uh, restaurants, hotels, uh, leisure and hospitality sectors dr dropped, perhaps more counterintuitively, educational services um, were disrupted, particularly private institutions, which had to cut back. Uh, but even though we were in the thick of one of the worst healthcare crises in our history, uh, we actually saw some backsliding in that sector as well, because as a result of the pivoting to respond to the pandemic, there was a suspension of a lot of the normal service activities uh, that support employment and income in our private and public hospitals. And so the, that sectoral tail of the tape um, has, been, uh, has been quite stark in terms of the difference between the experiences of workers and employers in those frontline uh, positions that rely on face-to-face uh, -face interactions uh, and business transactions, as opposed to those of us who are working in settings where we can just as easily do our work remotely with a with a with a minimum amount of disruption. Um, whoop, excuse me. Uh, if we take a look at the headline unemployment rate, it looks like the labor market is in pretty strong condition. But if we take a step back and look at the the labor market in Massachusetts using the most broad measure of unemployment, that is, people who are unemployed. Uh, people who are working part-time and say they would rather work full-time, that is, they're underemployed, uh, or they have dropped out and they've given up searching for work, the so-called U6 measure, the Massachusetts unemployment rate remains above 9%, which is extremely high and well uh, above the levels uh, pre-pandemic. And so 
there's no question that even as employers have a very difficult time recruiting the employees they need, particularly with the skills they need in this environment, there are uh, folks out there in the labor market who are who are searching for work and seeking opportunities. I think part of this is a skills gap uh, problem where the jobs that are available aren't necessarily well aligned with the skills of the people who are looking. And the other is, I think, a uh, some have called it the great resignation. I think it's also the great career change, as well as people, particularly in those frontline facing fields, look for greener pastures elsewhere in environments that uh, pay a more competitive wage uh, and offer uh, what these workers at least perceive would be a more safe working environment. Um, this um, more large uh, uh, trend, I'm trying to figure out how to pr progress this. Excuse me. This basically is part of a larger demographic story that we've been dealing with in Massachusetts for generations now. We've relied very heavily on international immigration as a source of, of employment growth, uh, a source of labor force growth, and, and ultimately the driver of our population. As you can see, and this is information um, gathered by the UMass Donahue Institute, which is the official repository for the US Census, uh, Bureau's information in Massachusetts, that in this past year, we've actually seen the death rate uh, exceed the, the birth rate. So the old fashioned way of growing the population, which hasn't always been our strong suit here, that is, um, you know, a surplus of births over deaths, appears to have reversed. We have an aging population, we're a very well educated state. And I think that serves us well in many respects, but we tend to start our families later and we tend to have uh, smaller families. So close to home, my wife and I have one child. Unless one of us is immortal, that means that the net contribution of the Goodman family to the Massachusetts population over time will be negative one, right? Because there's two of us and one of him. Uh, so as we rely on people who can be attracted here from other parts of the world and other parts of the country, you can see here the trade balance, and this is the bottom line, domestic migration of, of people coming to Massachusetts from other states as compared to people leaving Massachusetts for other states has largely been negative, except during periods of extraordinary economic opportunity here. And so over the long run, uh, finding the labor that we need to support growth here in Massachusetts and New England and more broadly in the Northeast US uh, is going to continue to be a problem. And I think uh, current economic conditions and the pace and nature of the recovery from the pandemic induced recession have, I think, brought into stark relief some of those uh, long term challenges and have made them uh, serious challenges for employers in the in the short term. Uh, at the same time, I think we've seen people leaving the workforce who in previous cycles might have been uh, inclined to extend their date of retirement. If you see on the chart to the left, uh, the Great Recession, uh, that bar around 2008 to 2010 there, what we saw is uh, you know, lower rates of retirement of those workers in, active in the labor market who were over 55. Uh, that I think had something to do with catastrophic losses in uh, in household income related to job losses during that period, drop in housing values, disruption in investment markets that I think caused people to who had certain kinds of retirement timelines to revisit them and to recover some of the lost income and lost uh, wealth that they were going to rely upon to retire. This time around, it's a bit different. Uh, I think the, the housing market has remained uh, quite hot and robust. Values are up. The stock market up until recently has been quite strong. And so retirement accounts have been up too. And of course, the nature of COVID-19 and its variants disproportionately uh, brings risk to bear on uh, older people, all things equal. And so I think that's been a recipe for an increase above trend of people being inclined to leave the labor force permanently and to become, and to become retired. All of this puts downward pressure on labor supply creates some very meaningful challenges uh, for Massachusetts and more broadly for New England and the US. Most of the time we have counter cyclical industries here in the Commonwealth that have been the source of high quality job opportunities, robust job growth and uh, um, you know, a big part of our economic competitiveness proposition. If you take a look at this blue line at the top, that's all the employees in Massachusetts, the change in total employment in education and health services broadly defined. And as you can see in the last recession, 2008-2009, uh, it was almost as if they weren't affected. They continued to grow despite one of those most uh, 
uh, dramatic reversals of economic fortune in our in our living memory up until quite recently. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, those sectors uh, were really hit fairly hard this time around, despite being more important than ever, and have not recovered quite as quickly. So these countercyclical employers that have sort of held up the Massachusetts economy during tough times, uh, education, health services uh, in blue, professional and business services in that light green, and, and overall employment appear to be following the same path this time. And so there hasn't really been uh, a, a safe port in this storm. Although, as you can see, the trajectory of recovery coming out of this recession, again, has been much faster. And I think, if anything, that pace is constrained less by demand for workers and more by their supply. Um, the other issue that I think it's worth highlighting and I'm sure is on a lot of your minds is the inflationary environment. Excuse me. Um, the prices have been rising across the economy, and that's been something that has led to some considerable debate within the economics profession. This is the, the most recent snapshot of year over year price changes measured by the U.S. Consumer Price Index for all urban consumers. The latest reading had a, a, an ex, a, a very high, in, especially in recent historical terms, reading of 7.5%. And so I've been sort of a member of Team Transitory, and I still think that uh, it's going to be a while before prices stabilize, but that we're not entering into some late 70s era double-digit inflation period or stagflation or, or some related catastrophe. Although I think that's going to be an empirical question going forward. When we take a look at some of the components, things that have been driving the increase in prices, a lot of them do uh, appear to be affected by growth in demand as uh, as the economy emerges from the most restrictive pandemic conditions. So you see a lot of the increase being driven by energy, um, home heating, gasoline for vehicles. You can see there propane and kerosene and other sectors and, uh, and motor vehicles, um, which have uh, seen a jump in price um, as a result of some of the supply chain kinks in the international system, which have prevented some key components, key electronic components in, um, in particular from arriving in a timely basis. And so that's put a lot of upward lift in the late model used car market. And so a lot of these price increases are concentrated in certain areas of the economy that I think when we see some relief uh, in the supply chain problems uh, and some, uh, um, you know, I think more predictable pandemic conditions will fade. But in the meantime, that doesn't do very much for uh, households and businesses that still have to pay these prices. Obviously, the cost of food, the cost of housing, and the cost of energy uh, relating to transportation in particular are big drivers for household expenses. And so there are, uh, there are, there are definitely downsides to this, but I do think that it's something that uh, is likely to be part of the mix for the next 12 months or so. But I think, um, um, at least based on the evidence we have today, I, I, I think as the global supply chain recovers, uh, we should see some moderation in this as vehicle producers start to meet that demand and we don't see limited supply pricing up labor and pricing up uh, these goods. Also, I think we've already begun to see consumption patterns shifting, whereas households and businesses shifting from buying goods to buying services uh, in, in part a response to these rising prices. Well, thank you, Michael. That was an excellent presentation. Um, of course, we're all worried about inflation and it's uh, heartening to think that uh, it may be coming down as soon as the pandemic comes down. What's your response to that? Um, let's see. Um, so let's take a look at it. I do. I think I think if we look here at um, uh, at the supply chain, um, we still are going to have a problem until we see some of the um, uh, pandemic conditions improve in some of our trading partners around the world, particularly in Asia. Uh, you can see we also have kinks locally in some of the port personnel, truck drivers. We're seeing that certainly in the European Union and Great Britain, but also here in the U.S., particularly in the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, where we're simply not able to unload the uh, uh, and accept the shipments that are coming in from, from around the world, uh, Ken. I can go on, or I'm happy to take more questions if you'd like. Well, thank you very much. Um, 
there is one other request that we have all your slides. So <laughs> yes, so, the, <laughs> so the good the good news is that there's more of them, and I'm happy to take any questions as time permits, or certainly as part of the panel. I do think I'd like to conclude by highlighting that climate change and climate action. Uh, are really critical opportunities as well as critical risk factors to the regional economy. We're seeing a whole shift in our energy supply network thanks to the emergence of offshore wind, which is creating a number of critically important uh, economic opportunities for Southern New England in particular. And, and so I think the, the conversation that the panel will have today, and I think the remarks that, uh, that Dean Kite will make shortly um, are, 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 are very timely and important. This is a good time for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you again, Michael. That was wonderful. And that um, now allows me to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Rachel Kite, who is the 14th Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. And I'm a graduate of Tufts, so it's uh, exciting to introduce uh, someone of this stature. She is the first woman to lead the nation's oldest graduate school, only School of International Affairs, Prior to joining Fletcher, Dean Kite served as a special representative to the UN Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Energy for All. She previously was the World Bank Group Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change, leading the run-up to the Paris Agreement. Uh, Dean Kite has been very involved over the years in uh, climate, climate policies and working at the highest level of government and we're just looking forward to her remarks. Uh, Prof, uh, Dean Kite, uh, please uh, lead us on. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kenneth, for your introduction. And it's great to be able to be here today, even if it is only remotely. And uh, I hope that I can segue really from that wonderful uh, tour of the horizon from, from Michael. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully this will work. And I hope that that's uh, okay. Now, there's a lot to say in a very short uh, uh, space of time. And so I'm going to give a very sort of 64,000 foot um, sense of uh, where we stand in sort of global climate um, negotiations, but also global climate action. And as you know, uh, the UK hosted the uh, negotiations, the 26th round of negotiations uh, in November last year in the uh, wonderful uh, city of Glasgow. And um, let me try and move my slides on. There we go. And um, what I'm going to try to do today is give you a little bit of the context where the breakthroughs and perhaps the challenges uh, were, and then look forward to climate action in this year and, and to some of the opportunities. Uh, so I'll go global and then try and tie it back to the to the local business context. So I think uh, the most important thing is to remember that um, what we're trying to do is balance the global economy with um, uh, with the with the chemistry of the planet, and so the science drives action, uh, and the science uh, suggests that we need to be at net zero emissions. Uh, uh, by, by, by mid-century, that we need to be at 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. So this means that we have to um, have substantial cuts in emissions uh, by 2030, about 45% of emissions need to be um, uh, ended by 2030, and that we need to be net zero by 2050. And as you know, most um, global companies, uh, many uh, smaller companies are making uh, climate, uh, carbon neutrality or net zero uh, commitments. Um, and governments were to come to Glasgow with ratcheted up ambition, five years, six because of COVID, but five years after the Paris Agreement. So a ratcheting up of ambition. And so we did see a ratcheting up of ambition by countries in terms of how they will get to net zero by 2050. Um, but what we, when we tally it all up, we're not there yet. We're not on the right trajectory. So we entered into Glasgow um, quite uh, a long way off target, about two and a half, 2.9 degrees rather than one and a half degrees as a result of all of our cumulative action. And remember, these are pledges. These haven't been done yet. And then we saw additional commitments being made while we were in Glasgow, most notably by Prime Minister Modi. 
And so then the tallying up of, OK, well, if you take all of the commitments that have been made while we're in Glasgow and the commitments in the run up to Glasgow, where are we? And we're, we're getting better, but we are still a long way off the one and a half degrees that we need in order to get on track. And so if the story of last year was the ambition gap, and that's still the story that we have an, a gap in our ambition, we are not ambitious enough to bring ourselves into balance. The story of 2022 is also a story of the implementation gap. So we have a gap in admission in, in ambition, but we've also got a gap in our actions. Our actions do not equal our words. And this is a story for the United States. It's a story for the European Union, for the UK, for China, for India, for all major emitting economies. And it's also then the struggling context for developing countries who themselves have to move through um, in all, transitions of energy and transport and urbanization, also have to invest in their adaptation to climate change, and who feel that uh, the developed world is not yet doing what it needs to do and is not yet um, in, 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 in substantially enough uh, helping developing countries to meet their own needs. Now, the host role of these climate talks has become a bigger and bigger and bigger effort. And one of the reasons why the UK won the sort of opportunity to host COP26 was because there was a very strong feeling that because there is a statutory anchor to the UK's own net zero commitment, that we have uh, legislation uh, which uh, enshrines our own commitments. So we can see partisan bickering and we can see uh, disagreements within parties and between parties, but we have a statutory obligation to get to net zero. That this was a, a, a place that could host this critical uh, round of negotiations and would also bring, uh, and Peter will be testimony to this uh, later in the session, would bring a global diplomatic uh, um, muscle strength to, to the job of wrangling countries into making greater ambition, uh, more ambitious pledges and to reaching agreement. The UK brought a, brought a very particular sort of bilateral approach or minilateral approach to multilateral action, which means that they, over and above the UN negotiations, focused on cash, coal, cars and trees. Uh, Prime Minister bon Johnson likes, um, uh, likes uh, slogans. Uh, and this was really trying to focus on areas where we could leap forward and pull up and sort of pull ourselves collectively forward. So cash is the issue of finance, which I'll come on to. Coal, we need to end the burning of coal uh, for energy and for other uses globally. And there's been a lot of commitments made on that, but we have to um, really um, wean ourselves off coal as the most polluting and most dangerous to our health, as well as the planet's health source of, uh, source of energy. Cars, the great transition that we're beginning to see um, really gain momentum. So the, the, the moving to um, uh, emissions-free vehicles, not just cars, but trucks um, um, and light goods vehicles, that that needed to be sped up. And then trees really refers to the fact that nature is our friend in our energy transitions, in our transition towards net zero. And we have to find ways to invest in nature in situ so that we can still have uh, a strong natural uh, sort of sequestration of, of carbon emissions. And so we saw some very big announcements in, in, in Glasgow. GFANS is the Glasgow Financial uh, um, uh, Alliance for Net Zero. So uh, 450 financial institutions, more than $130 trillion of assets under management pledging to be net zero. Lots of critique of, of greenwashing. And this is going to be the year where each of the signatories to GFANS will have to show that that is actually a science-based commitment. But nevertheless, we've never seen that kind of mobilization of the financial sector before. A funding deal for South Africa. You're going to see more of that this year. The international community coming together and helping countries that are deeply carbonized, are deeply coal dependent, make a transition away to a more diversified energy mix quicker than they would do on their own. South Africa was the sort of flagship, but now you're starting to see uh, discussions around Indonesia, Vietnam, and then other countries. Deforestation. Uh, this is the most dangerous thing we can do is to continue to deforest at the rates that we do. So anything that we can do to bring resources to the table to halt that deforestation. And there were bigger pledges made in China coming into an alliance on deforestation. The International Sustainability Standards Board, very important for business. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, are rated by different uh, NGOs and different think tanks and different entities in terms of your own commitments to climate, your own commitments to sustainability. 
Um, you may have one rating um, with the, the, the climate initiative, you have another rating with CDP, another rating with somebody else, and your auditors will have to start rating you and you're going to start being uh, perhaps regulated or stress tested, depending on what kind of business you're in. And there was an agreement that there will be an internationally international sustainability standards board to so a convergence around how we measure and what measure what we measure when we judge the sustainability of a company. Very important agreement on methane, a highly uh, accelerating uh, greenhouse gas, uh, 40 times more dangerous uh, than CO2. And really this brings the focus on the gas industry. So for those who say that gas is cleaner than coal, well, not when you take methane into account and uh, not when you take some of the other ancillary impacts of gas into account. So how, is, how are we managing our transition? And then finance being very important. Finance, perhaps the critique of Glasgow is that the developed world did not step up to the plate with public resources, sufficient public resources to transfer to developing countries to help them with their adaptation and their resilience to the impacts of climate change. And pledges have been made and pledges have been unfulfilled. And this puts a slightly toxic element into the international solidarity that is needed if we are to combat climate change and allows developing countries to feel that um, uh, you know, we say, uh, do as we say, but not do as we do. And we're not perhaps as developed countries coming to the table with the resources necessary. But the United States, after having a four years hiatus under President Trump was back, um, but is behind on its uh, financial commitments. And um, because many of those financial commitments need to go through Congress, the US is still somewhat missing in action uh, on this point. With this is also about public money leveraging private money into investing in the infrastructure, the clean energy infrastructure, the clean transport infrastructure, and the possibilities of nature-based solutions in developing countries as well. And so that public money isn't just a transfer, it's a way to bring other investors in. But beyond just public transfers of money, we did see agreement on um, language around how we should build the architecture of carbon markets going forward, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And we saw extraordinary, as I said, uh, commitments of private finance. And these are some of the breakthroughs that I think the British government felt very proud uh, of, of having brokered or at least uh, ushered forward. We saw commitments uh, to, to, to exit financing, from fossil fuel uh, power, and you saw more commitments for R&D and for investment in clean power. You saw major commitments around moving towards zero emission vehicles, but you also saw commitments uh, on zero emissions vessels. And uh, in the weeks running up to um, uh, Glasgow, in fact, here in Boston, uh, IATA and the uh, air transport industry also committed to net zero. Now that's going to be a long journey, uh, but an important commitment. Steel and the hard to abate sectors, all making progress and a growing coalition around near zero emission steel. Hydrogen, very important here in the Northeast. Can we build a green hydrogen economy using excess wind or excess solar in other parts of the world? And what would that mean? And can we start blending uh, clean hydrogen or green hydrogen into gas infrastructure in order to speed the transition? And then uh, also some commitments around agriculture. I've already mentioned South Africa, finance was really a very important uh, issue. And we saw exiting of finance from fossil fuels, but not yet the kinds of pledges that are needed into developing countries to finance the transition. And then guardrails, you say you're net zero, I say I'm carbon neutral. How do we understand that? How do we know if that is actually real? How do we measure it? How is it transparent? Who regulates it? Does it have any implications? These kinds of issues for non-state actors, not just for governments, are now the subject of, uh, of work by the United Nations Secretary General, who is going to put guardrails in place. So looking forward, think about uh, ambition at the global level, having to translate to implementation at the national level. And so now very much a focus on do, do countries, do states, do regions, do cities have in place the policy pathways that they need to drive their ambition? How do you manage an energy transition, a transport transition, a food systems transition all at the same time? How do you um, establish benchmarks and mileposts and be able to report out? How do you manage your financial system that it, so that investment is flowing into green and flowing into resilient investments and flowing away from those things that we uh, need less of? How do you invest in your resilience and adaptation? 
Are we investing not enough of our R&D and our investments in the technologies we are going to need over the next 20 to 30 years? And there have been big upticks in both private and public and publicly inspired private investment in this field. There's still much more to go. But obviously here in New England, this is an extraordinary opportunity given the research capability we have uh, here in the region and some of the extraordinary energy inv innovations and new companies coming on. And then the hidden costs and burdens. I think that th this is really still, we see this in the UK, we see it here in the United States, still a sort of knife fight going on about, you know, can we afford to make these investments right now? Maybe we should need to kick the can down the road. Economically, the cost of inaction is way higher than the cost of action, but still we struggle to persuade policymakers of that fact. And then I think just a, a question of governance, bandwidth and coordination. Listening to CEOs in Glasgow, I was very much struck by the fact that not one of them uh, felt secure that they could access the talent pipeline for the kinds of transitions that we are going to go through in the next uh, decade and, and next 20 years. And so a huge responsibility uh, in the public sector in terms of education systems, but also then for public and private uh, institutions of learning to make sure that both for blue collar and white collar jobs, we are training the people that we will need. And obviously, the uh, wind, uh, the wind, uh, the offshore wind opportunity in, in, uh, in off, the off the coast of Rhode Island, Massachusetts, is, is a case in point. Are we producing the people who are going to be able to take those jobs and drive that, that transition and that industry forward? And the last point I wanted to make is the carbon markets. So there was an agreement in Glasgow around the um, around how countries would treat each other uh, in in the trading uh, of carbon credits, and this will be um, now evolved with supervisory bodies at the UN level, etc. And that's going to be slow moving, but there is an extraordinary pent up appetite and interest and need to see whether we can develop voluntary carbon markets. Voluntary carbon markets that would be purposeful, that would help us reduce emissions and therefore speed the way to the net zero, but also that would help transfer resources to countries and communities and cities that might need them. Now, there's an enormous pent up demand for this because as every company or every financial institution commits to net zero, not all of the reduction of the emissions that goes with that will be able to be easily done from operations. And so being able to offset with um, verifiable and high integrity credits will make it possible for some companies to be able to meet goals of net zero. But the rules for these markets are not in place. And there is an extraordinary um, sort of uh, anxiety around greenwashing. And so there are a number of processes in place this year that by the time we get to sort of May or June, you will begin to see guidance for companies who want to use voluntary carbon markets to meet their own um, carbon neutrality targets and goals. And you will start to see um, guidance and standards for credits that would be issued by uh, a developing country or by a, a jurisdiction that has um, a, a credit surplus. So a lot of sort of bootstrapping of rules onto markets which are already underway. So the next COP, the next round of negotiations is in November, is in Egypt, it's an African COP. Expect the focus to be on how um, the developed world that caused this problem, that got us into this crisis because of the way in which we have emitted uh, dangerous uh, greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases over the last 50 to 75 years, that how are we going to help Africa make a transition and not pay the price and, and have an additional burden as a result of it not being uh, the source of the problem. So expect much more focus on adaptation, focus on loss and damage, which can be understood as payments for the, uh, really for uh, liability or for even for reparations, it's just language that is sometimes used. And then lots of opportunities from the Chinese, from the US and from, from the EU um, to, to make good on the Build Back Better pledges that they've made globally. So not only Build Back Better domestically, but also how um, recovery from uh, the extraordinary economic dislocation globally as a result of the pandemic could actually lead to uh, perhaps um, a greener and cleaner pathway forward. So it's all to play for because it's all about implementation. I will stop sharing my screen and I'd be very happy to enter, uh, enter into a conversation. Thank you, Dean Kite. That was excellent. What a great presentation of uh, where we are today. Um, I have a comment question. 
and watching the Super Bowl on Sunday, I was taken by the number of car and truck commercials selling electronic vehicles. And at the end of the football game, I th- my mind was kind of set on my next car is going to probably be an electric car. And I'm wondering, what is the dynamics between governments, which you've been working with so much in trying to get these things done, and industry, which is represented by the car industry, which have made commitments to be you know, all electric by what, 2030. Well, what's going on there? What's the dynamic that's happening? Is, is, is the companies pulling this forward, pushing it, or the, are the governments pushing the companies, or is it a collaboration? How, how do you perceive it as, as operating at this point? Uh, so it's a great question. I think it's a it's a minuet, right? It's a, it's a little dance. And it's a dance that has a different rhythm in the European Union as it does in the United States, as it does in China, the big and, and Japan, the big uh, uh, car and truck manufacturing centers. Um, and I think what, what's interesting is that the companies, it started off with electric vehicles, it started off with cars, right? But you, you, companies have to make decisions now in terms of R&D and investment for lines that will go 10, 20 years out. So you're making a decision today over something that's going to come to market in a decade or more. And so I think that companies internalized the science and they internalized the, the idea that we're going to have to get to net zero. And so by the 2030s, uh, it's going to be non-viable to be driving um, um, uh, a vehicle that is emitting uh, and which is therefore going to be subject to either carbon prices in, in the EU or is going to be subject to other forms of regulation. And of course, you saw efficiency uh, efficiency demands coming through in regulation. So I, so I think that, I mean, I remember um, in the beginning of last year having a conversation with a European truck manufacturer and people thought that this would happen for cars but for trucks, people were thinking that the decision points would be another five, six, seven years out. Mm-hmm. The truck manufacturer made a decision because they were like, look, we, we're going to have to invest in meeting standards of SO2 and other noxious gases. We're going to have to make de- decisions around efficiency uh, for the new lines that we're developing now, or we simply switch to electric. And having analyzed all of this, we were like, there is absolutely no purpose in trying to build a cleaner internal combustion engine we should just switch. And so you actually saw the beginning of last year, the major European truck manufacturers making the commitment that they're only gonna be producing electric or in some cases, um, hydrogen uh, trucks. And you've seen the same thing happen in the United States. So even though we've had a a back and forth between Obama, Trump, and then Biden administrations over standards, over the ability of California to set the standards uh, itself, so while there's been this uh, indecision from a regulatory standpoint, frankly, the companies are looking at their investments over time and concluding that the only, ve- the only viable um, uh, vehicles uh, into the next decade are going, to be, uh, are going to be ones that can run on green electricity or ones that can run uh, on clean hydrogen. So um, it's an interplay, but I think that the b- ability of businesses to look around the corners and to see what's coming leads those long-term investment decisions and it suits them if the eu the us and china are more broadly aligned in terms of how quickly we're going to get to net zero because obviously they're manufacturing for a global market we have to make sure that all of our nasty gas guzzling um diesel and other and and, uh, um, internal combustion engine vehicles don't then get dumped in the sahara or across Africa or across Latin America. And so there will have to be some kind of global uh, clunker buyback program. Uh, and that will be something that you will see, I think, uh, under discussion at the G20 and in the United Nations. Interesting, thank you, that was excellent. There is one question here, which kind of picks up on your just comment, you said about green energy. And it said, what's your observation about the fact that electronic vehicles are fueled fundamentally by the grid, which we're getting from coal, gas, et cetera, at this point. So could you just expound upon the connection between green energy and these electronic vehicles? Yeah, so the theory of change is that you electrify everything and you have clean electricity. So your your electricity grid would increasingly go to an energy mix with more renewables in it. Mm -hmm. And then you run everything off that grid, including cars. 
uh, and, and light goods vehicles and heavy goods vehicles. Now, at the moment, the energy mix is, um, is not as clean as it needs to be, but it's moving in one direction. Uh, and then there's an argument about uh, the total sort of energy footprint of building uh, an electric car and, and the battery of that versus an internal combustion engine. Uh, and the, you know, the, there's, I can give you plenty of Twitter feeds where people argue about which is the heaviest footprint. But I think that uh, consumer demand is very clear. Um, but the grid will clean up. And so we're, we're moving in, in one direction and only one direction. Very good. Thank you, Dean Kite. That's been a great, great presentation. Very interesting. And a, now a great lead into our, our panel uh, where we are going to hear from industry people and how, uh, uh, how their industries are reacting to uh, clean energy. Um, and it's my honor now, Peter Abbott, if you could come on board. There he is. Uh, Dr. Peter Abbott is the British Consul General of New England. He's been here since 2020. Uh, unlike other Consul Generals, we haven't seen him out in the public as much because of the pandemic. So I hope you get re-upped here around so you get a good exposure to Boston as you're going forward. The Consul Generals have been a wonderful addition to our, our uh, local culture over the years. Um, he has been a member of Her Majesty's Diplomatic Service for 15 years, and before coming to Boston, he served as Counselor at the High British Command in the Islamabad, Pakistan, which have been, must have been a fascinating post. He had operational oversight of the largest mission in the UK overseas diplomatic network, an accomplished uh, uh, international diplomat, and he even served some time in our Congress and working in politics in Massachusetts, in, the, in, the, in this country, nationwide, um, when he first started his career, which is probably another interesting thing we could talk to, to Dr. Abbott about. Uh, with that, Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you. We can introduce the panel, and we're looking forward to your presentations. Thank you very much indeed, Ken, for that very generous uh, introduction, and thank you for your comments at the start. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with uh, everybody today, uh, particularly uh, my old friend Rachel. Uh, lovely to, to be on the same panel again uh, with you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, the other panellists uh, in, a, in a second, but Rachel, then I want to come back to you uh, and just ask a couple of questions that have been um, prompted in my mind from, from your remarks. But uh, I want to introduce Veronique, Claire and Natalie uh, as well, uh, who I hope will um, uh, pop their cameras on uh, so that we can see their faces. There we go. Um, Veronique Bourgier is Vice President Strategy and Marketing at Veolia North America, a global leader in water waste and energy management. Veronique began her career with the company in France before moving to the United States eight years ago. And prior to her current role, Veronique was Business Development Director responsible for Veolia's digital uh, transformation. Uh, moving across my screen to Claire. Claire Dichter is UK Head of Corporate Strategy for National Grid, one of the world's largest investor-owned energy companies. Uh, Claire has worked in a range of regulatory, commercial and operational roles and has been at, uh, at what Claire describes as the sharp end of changes uh, in the UK power sector, including being responsible for optimising the power grid in the UK for the UK's first ever coal-free day uh, on the 21st of April 2017, I think it was, Claire. And finally, uh, Natalie, Natalie Wallace is Global Head of Sustainable Investing at Nat Natixis Investment Managers. Uh, Natalie oversees the firm's sustainable investment strategic goals and is responsible for driving Natixis Investment Managers uh, investment commitments across its distribution network, its affiliate managers and as part of industry-wide initiatives. So I can't think of three better people uh, to talk to uh, in this in this conversation and uh, in light of in light of Rachel's comments uh, a little bit earlier but Rachel I'm going to start with you because I know uh, you can't stick around for the, the whole rest of the conversation I wanted to um, to, to focus on my first question on this uh, this issue of uh, what the UN is calling guardrails. You also mentioned the Inter International Sustainability Standards Board. We haven't really got into private sector regulation yet, but I think we might do uh, as we come through this conversation. Tell us a little bit more about why this is important. I mean, I've, I speak to companies a lot about net zero commitments, and I think for some companies it's confusing, mm -hmm. and for other companies it's the, you know, the, the, the sort of a lack of lack of a framework is actually an opportunity, frankly, to wriggle around some of the commitments because it's, it's you know, it's quite vague and you can't compare uh, apples and oranges. So tell us a little bit more about why these sorts of things are important. And I'd be particularly interested in, uh, you know, in your role at Tufts, 
what what position there is for sort of universities and research centres to help inform the development of these so-called guardrails. Yeah, so I, so I think that I mean, from the sort of company out, and obviously you've got three three leading companies, and it, you know, with lots of um, lots of history, certainly National Grid and Veolia, in 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 working through how to stake out leadership in in sustainability writ large, right? So, so making a commitment to net zero, um, what does that mean? How do you measure that? Is that scope one, scope two, or scope three? So that means you know your own operations, your broader operations, or all the way down your supply chain. How do you measure that? Uh, how can you, uh, if it's not enforced anywhere, you're really out there on your own as well in in a sort of free in a free flowing uh, environment. And so it's very important. And the pressure, I think, the story of the last few years has been extraordinary pressure on companies to. Um, get out of the fossil fuel economy and start leading the, the the way into a cleaner into a cleaner economy, and I think we're now pivoting from just pure pressure into having confidence that companies' pledges are real, um, that the, they can be validated. Um, but absent regulation, who who is going to validate them? And you, I mean, here in Massachusetts, you, you've got a whole group of companies actually originating here, but also across the country and across Europe. Who are using you know machine learning and big data to sort of you know help companies understand or you know whether or not they can meet their um, their obligations or to help them even measure methane leakages down their supply chain and things like that. So there's a whole sort of digital sort of monitoring, reporting, and verification that's growing up outside of regulation. So what are we going to see? We're going to see certainly in the UK, you're starting to see the government say that it will require. Um, require reporting rather than just voluntary reporting uh, against some of these things. You're starting to see stress tests of banks coming out of the UK. You're going to see that in the European Central Bank as well. The SEC is consulting at the moment and the FSOC in Washington is starting to look at how to put in place all of the beginning of the sort of regulation of what it would require in terms of your transparency about your exposure to, to carbon as a, a bad asset that we shouldn't be holding. The, the guardrails from the UN are really about, I mean, if you're the Secretary General and you're sort of in charge of sort of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, the question you're asking yourself is, how do we know whether we're on track or not? So governments are supposed to disclose that to the UN. Big in parenthesis, because it's another conversation, much of that disclosure has got big holes in it. And we, you know, many countries are not reporting, I think, comprehensively or with or with integrity. But then everybody else is making a pledge, whether it's Sadiq Khan in London, or whether it's uh, Mayor Wu here, or whether it is um, uh, Paris, you know, cities are making pledges. But how do we know who measures that? They're not countries. And then companies and financial sector. So what the Secretary General is doing is putting in place a set of guardrails that will help guide non-state actors in, in their pledges and then help, I think, us know whether or not we can take a pledge uh, at face value. And you will start to see then, I think, the emergence of some kind of governance around that. But for the moment, because there are no rules, it really goes to the integrity of the boardroom and the integrity of the C-suite. You shouldn't be doing something or, or saying something that you can't back up and you can't validate. And your net zero journeys have to be science based. Investors will demand that increasingly for those who are publicly traded. And then consumers will demand it. And of course, every Friday, there'll be thousands of young people around the world striking and bringing your brand into disrepute if they think they can't trust your pledge. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think that you know the, the, this question of sort of public pressure is is interesting, and for, for somebody who's relatively sort of an observer of this, you would say that public pressure has reached really, really quite a high a high level. But I still hear from some companies that I speak to that you know, don't seem to really always be wanting to move quite as quickly as they as they possibly could. Uh, I mean, how much more of this argument do we need to have to win uh, before, and none of the companies, I should say, on this call, of course, uh, would feel this way. But, you know, there, there are some people who feel, you know, including in rather large companies, but quite back markers on some of this. So how much more pressure does there have to be brought to bear? How much more evidence do we need uh, that climate change is, is real and is such a threat? No, it's a good question. And I think we're probably at peak pressure. I think what's going to start happening is um, more and more companies are beginning to analyze their transition risk. 
So if you've got, you know, if you've got uh, distribution plants and, or manufacturing plants around the world, they're increasingly going to be disrupted because of extreme weather, because of climate change, by extreme heat, by storms, fires, whatever. And it's very interesting to see a number of leading companies not having really that maybe they thought about uh, the risk of carbon, but they hadn't really thought about their transition risk. And so you're starting to see more and more companies work through uh, how much uh, how much is at risk um, from the kinds of climate impacts that we're seeing around the world. And that's going to start translating into the bottom line or is already translating to the bottom line. When you put a name around that number, then it becomes important. The insurance markets are going to be moving as well. We've already seen supply chain disruption as a result of COVID. That's going to extend as we see extreme climate events. And then on the, on the public policy side, we're, start, we're going to have to start see the rolling up of the numbers. So if climate impacts cost Colorado 5% of GDP every year, if we routinely are losing $150 billion um, due to storms every year, and that, by the way, is just the physical, it doesn't account for people who are moving, people who are dislocated, all of the social costs, then that's going to start adding up. And I think that we, um, we, we need to sort of name that. And the federal government doesn't do a very good job of sort of adding all of that up. And, and I think that that's going to drive it. Now, the public... The public are quixotic. They don't have to be consistent. So the New England public wants to be net zero. They want to be carbon neutral. They don't want, they don't want transmission lines through their backyard. They don't necessarily want a solar plant across the road. So this is where we have to have an honest conversation and a public dialogue about the cost of inaction being higher than the cost of action. A final question for you, Rachel, and I can see by your answers in the faces of our panelists there's lots of meat here uh, to get into in the conversation a bit later the final question for you Rachel is on uh, workforce development or as you put it as a talent pipeline um, for for energy transition and I'm sorry to put you on the spot about this but I'd be really interested to know what Tufts is doing uh, to help with that kind of workforce development we work very closely with the National Offshore Wind Institute at the Bristol Community College who uh, they're doing one of the setting up one of the first curriculums for offshore wind training I've met a company out in Rhode Island is helping to put offshore wind and engineering into primary school uh, lessons. So people really start to think, kids start to think about careers in advanced engineering at a very young age. But curious to know if, if Tufts is playing a sort of a, you know, a, a role in helping that workforce development. Well, I think we, we like everybody else. So we've got lots of things going on. And I think we, we haven't sort of pulled it together um, well to explain that this is actually a response to this trend. And I think also just discovering how big the need for talent is and really understanding what employers want. So what, so I, we're a school of international affairs. What I'm hearing from employers, whether they are in the international system or whether they're dip, diplomatic core or from the private sector, 30% of our students go into the private sector, is that they're looking for people who understand the engineering, but also understand the policy environment. Well, together with the engineering school here, where we've got a whole concentration on wind power, we think we can do that. And we will bring out credentials that give you that specific uh, ticket for, to ride. Uh, our veterinarian school, uh, where we're doing a, an extraordinary amount of work on One Health. So this is, this is um, you know, as we destroy nature and as uh, nature provides less of a bulwark, you know, we're going to see with ch temperature changes, we're going to see more zoonotic diseases uh, because of climate change coming into it. So how do we cope with that? And how are we training our veterinarians for that? The medical school, obviously, very uh, attuned to making sure that doctors are going out into the workforce, aware of, um, aware of the uh, public health impacts of climate change. And then our nutrition school, the food system, how do, we, uh, how do we manage to put a plate of nutritious food, which is also produced sustainably in front of everybody on the planet? But I think that we, we will be bringing that together. Uh, we'll have a new climate science, climate science department at the School of Arts and Sciences, and we will have a climate concentration coming out together across the university and hopefully be an integrated partner for employers because we know you need, uh, you need the skills and you also need the people who understand the policy environment, not just in the US, but globally. Very impressive. Rachel, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, ask a question now uh, of Claire, uh, pivoting from the, the references to, to offshore wind. Claire, uh, National Grid, National Grid, big supporter 
uh, of offshore wind uh, in the Northeast, particularly uh, in New England. Tell us a little bit about uh, National Grid's uh, interest in, in offshore wind and perhaps in particular um, some of the modifications and modernization that needs to go into the electricity infrastructure, into the grid to be able to accept that, uh, that clean energy from, from offshore wind. Thanks, Peter. Well, so it's interesting. So it, as, as you said earlier, um, GRID's one of the largest, um, the world's largest publicly owned utilities, and we operate in the UK and Northeast US. And actually, we're seeing that global wind challenge from two perspectives. So um, off the coast of New England, we've partnered with RWE to look at um, offshore wind opportunities there. And actually in the UK, we're just facing the huge deliverability challenge of connecting um, a government target of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 with, with the national grid role there being onshore and getting the power away from the coast and to where it's consumed. And um, there's a whole host of challenges right across that supply chain. And, and, and Rachel mentioned some of them, and I'm, I'm sure I'll repeat a few of them. Uh, points but um, the first one being the global supply chain everyone is trying to make this transition um, there's uh, a huge demand for skills and capabilities and materials um, across the world and um, each kind of country or state that is trying to move forward in their energy transition is competing with others for access to that supply chain. I think from, from National Grid's perspective, the, um, the best way to tackle that is early certainty. So working in partnership right across the value chain, so from um, kind of federal to state government to businesses to regulators and delivery partners, to get early certainty on um, the, the upfront commitments on what the targets are, and then commitments from business, both in terms of um, you know, cash um, and um, commitment to the value chain. Because the earlier you can lock in um, your certainty with that supply chain, the better chance you have of um, bringing in what you need and what that means for um, kind of communities picking up some of Rachel's other comments is that you can bring those jobs and opportunities into the local communities so when you do have the impact of the infrastructure because it is big infrastructure you can't avoid that but you can give something back to the community in terms of training and skills and jobs and make sure that that investment goes into the community that's impacted and you're not bringing that in from elsewhere across the kind of global economy. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I'm going to actually go back to Rachel, if I may. And I, I apologise, Claire, but I, I know Rachel's got to leave us. And I've just actually realised I need to be checking the chat. And I've seen a couple of uh, very, I think, spot on really questions from, from Segar, who's, who's, who's put them in the chat. The first question is about um, uh, making sure that the experience of people from the global south is recognised when we talk about climate change. Um, and then the second question is, is about um, resources for renewable energy coming from parts of the world which may not benefit from the, from the renewable energy. So things are mined, particularly for solar perhaps, but maybe for some other industries as well, where resources are mined and then they're taken somewhere else and the benefits of that cheap electricity, are, uh, you know, are, our experience in the developed world rather than the global south. So some two sort of quite um, knotty questions. Rachel, I wonder if you want to um, just have a go at, at, at one or both of them, uh, particularly perhaps from your experience of having been at COP26 and, and previous COPs as well. And then Claire, I'll come back to you. Yeah, so I think that um, obviously, you know, the, the developed world has exploited the resources of the developing world and used them for its own uh, advantage um, for you know 100 200 years um, and over the last you know 50 years or more we've exploited fossil fuels from those countries and they've you know not necessarily seen any many of the benefits of that themselves and obviously um, 
fossil fuel exploitation has brought its own economic curses. Uh, now we find a situation where um, we need to transition away from fossil fuels. And for many developing countries who still have large energy access gaps, um, the question is, you know, do we have to transition away as well? And are you imposing on us some kind of green colonialism on the back of uh, the relationships over the last decades? I think that most developing countries fully want to embrace and see the opportunity in embracing um, renewable energy. That is a resource that they have. Their renewable energy maps are richer in many cases than their fossil fuel maps. And obviously, perhaps you know, India is the greatest case in point, which the, the ambition of the Modi government uh, to uh, invest in India's own solar capability, but then to be the primary exporter of solar technology to the rest of the world is something that then, you know, France uh, uh, and then the rest of the European Union and the US is supporting. And it's an extraordinary strategic opportunity for the India as it as it weans itself off its coal and its coal past. Um, because it wants to meet net zero, because it needs clean air, because it needs to fulfill its own development uh, uh, aspirations. A huge opportunity then through the development of its own renewable energy industry to then become the manufacturing heart and the uh, hub for renewable energy technologies across Africa and elsewhere. So I, I, don't, I, I think that um, there, there are going to be extraordinary diplomatic uh, tussles over gas. I think there are a number of African leaders, for example, who believe that Africa should be able to exploit its gas. It needs to fill its energy access gaps now. And then there is going to be a lot of international finance that's not going to want to invest in gas because it needs to meet its own net zero targets. And so you're going to see a tussle. You already saw that at the Africa Union, European Union summit in recent in recent days. Um, so I think the responsibility of the developed world is to make sure that the resources and the finance are there for the developing world to go through a very speedy transition, which means investing in renewable energy technology, the transmission distribution, and off-grid as well as on-grid, so that all Africans have access to reliable power. And that's a win-win. It's uh, it's not a, an exploitation if done well, but that means we have to put the resources, we have to make the resources available, and US Congress is gonna have to pony up, as it will the European Union, as will the UK, China and Japan. Great, thank you, Rachel. And just a reminder to everyone else who's listening, please do put your questions uh, in the chat as well. We will try and get around to them uh, as best we can. Um, Claire, I'm gonna come back to you just with one final question. Um, I think National Grid has its own net zero target by 2050. I think that was made more ambitious uh, in the last uh, year. So that it was less ambitious than that and then was made more ambitious to the 2050 net zero target fairly recently. Can you just tell us quickly about what that was like from a corporate point of view, how you, uh, you know, came about setting those targets, what it felt like uh, to be trying to, trying to uh, get the metrics in place to make it achievable? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard, right? It's, um, we're, we're a big organisation and um, I was just going to say getting people comfortable with that is hard. And actually, I would say there's a lot of people that still aren't comfortable with that. So it's a commitment to get there. And um, I would say, honestly, we probably don't know how we're going to how we are going to get there for some of it. But there is an agreement to the commitment. And then the hard yards are to come on how we deliver that um, across all of our um, scope one two and three emissions it's, as Rachel said you know it's it's hard to measure as well so there's probably um there's three parts to it really so there's there's the emotional journey of bringing the people and the culture of the organization forward on that journey as you know it's the right thing to do it aligns with our strategy and vision it's the reason that people join national grid is our um, commitment to trying to lead in these areas. Then there's the technology and innovation. So how do we actually do some of those things? We still use um, sulfur hexafluoride in our substations, um, particularly in dense urban areas where there's space limitations. We have to find a way not to do that. Balancing that against the speed of delivery um, that we need um, to get the infrastructure in, in place quickly. 
Um, and then you have to measure it. So none of that will stack up if it's not transparent and you can report against it. So um, we um, we have committed to um, a responsible business charter that we publish alongside our annual report each year, which goes through the same level of scrutiny um, as our annual report does. And it's honest. So it says, um, you know, where we're ahead of the game. It says where we're finding things harder and it's um, it's traceable. So um, it it's not easy. Um, the hardest part is um, uh, getting the people on board with it. I think we've done that. But uh, the, the technology and the innovation and the delivery is still to come. Thank you, Claire. I think that honesty is, you know, is really important. And I think there's a lot that different companies can learn from each other by being honest with each other about the difficulties that they uh, that they face in making that transition. Um, Veronique, I'd like to come to you uh, next. Uh, Veolia uh, wants to be one of the most innovative um, companies uh, when it comes to sort of tackling climate change. Uh, tell us what that means. I mean, Claire has mentioned innovation, Rachel mentioned innovation, but tell us what innovation means uh, uh, for your company. Sure, thank you for inviting me and thanks Peter for the introduction. I'm delighted to participate in, uh, in this event. First, I would like to echo what Rachel uh, said about the environmental challenges humanity is facing today. Water scarcity, soil degradation, waste accumulation, and the extremes of weather from drought and fire to hurricanes and floods brought by climate change. These are not simply environmental issues, but they are business, social, political, humanitarian issues as well, tied together and indivisible. So at Veolia, we recognize that as the leader of environmental solutions, we have a responsibility to, to respond to the profound uh, challenges posed by this climate uh, change. We need to ramp up the transition towards carbon neutrality and accelerate the process of adapt adapting to climate change. And how can we do this? First, internally, we need to align our goals. So it means that COP26 goals align with Veolia Group purpose goals and KPIs. Veolia is committed with all its stakeholders to lead the changes necessary to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C and achieve net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. Second thing, we also need to be innovative. Yes, it's, it's really also a responsibility to respond with urgency and innovation. This is key to our goal of supporting ecological transformation. The key assets to successfully lead this, this ecological transformation are the ability to pioneer new solutions, funding by green investments, and I know that Natalie will talk about that, and integrated solutions allowing the municipal and industrial business to decarbonize their activities and adapt to the effects of climate change. This needs to happen at every level of our society. And some solutions already exist, but we also have to invent new ones. Some explanations here. Veolia sits at the nexus of water, waste, and energy. We see how these sectors are inextricably linked and we must break down the silos to usher in a true ecological transformation. That's great, Veronique, thank you. I'm always, uh, I have to say, fascinated by waste management companies that are committed to zero waste. Um, uh, because it feels like a sort of a bit of a sort of contradi contradiction. Um, can you, given that I've got you on the line, I can, and I'm the moderator, I can ask you this question. T tell me how you answer that. You know, is that a contradiction or, or is there some explanation that, that makes more sense? No, actually, we can capture value from rest streams to reduce the need for raw materials and associated energy expenditure, increasing efficiency and minimizing impacts. This is what we call the total waste management approach with a potential to zero to landfill goal or the holy grail, uh, the zero waste goal as the outcomes. We can also, you know, talking about ecological transformation, we can also preserve water by treating and reusing with water. We can then capture the byproducts 
for efficient reuse, such as in uh, soil replenishment or energy production. I will give you some, exist, some example of concrete uh, existing solutions. On the energy sector, when it comes to renewable energy, Veolia is helping in making clean energy even cleaner with our pioneering work recycling turbine, uh, wind turbine blades to support the manufacturing of cement, reducing greenhouse gas by 27%. We are also working with one of the largest chemical producers to overhaul the production facility infrastructure at one of its manufacturing facilities in Virginia to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by hundreds of thousands of tons. So Veolia also helps to expand the production of renewable energy in Toronto through capturing organics from conversion into biogas and digester solids to become compost. Another an example, which is in the middle between energy and water. In, and it explains as well, actually, how this everything is linked together. In Rialto, California, California, Veolia operates and maintains the city's wastewater treatment plant. The plant is located near a system of waterways inhabited uh, by an endangered species of fish. And the city asked Veolia to develop a solution for ensuring the plant could continue to operate in times of widespread power outages and blackouts, which have been unfortunately common in Southern California in recent years due to wildfires and other natural disasters exacerbated by climate change. In order to create greater energy, resilience, and the independence at the plant, VNA developed a plan to install an independent microgrid power source that will ensure that the plant remains operational in times of energy outages, independent of the main power grid. This microgrid is powered through a sustainable combination of solar, biogas, and backup battery storage to power this uh, wastewater treatment plant, which is kind of the first of its kind in, uh, in California. This innovation will minimize the risk of spills of leaks and the uh, spills or leaks and the water uh, of a, at the plant, sorry, that could impact the surrounding waterways and protect marine life and local biodiversity. On the water side, and I think it's already something we can duplicate. In Hawaii, we operate and maintain the state's largest water recl reclamation plant, treating an average of 13 million gallons of wastewater per day and converting 92% of it into recycled water for industrial and irrigation purposes. Another example on the west side, Peter, to come back to your, to your question, um, manufacturers in, in nearly any industry can benefit from this total waste management program, which aims to eliminate, reduce, or reuse waste and waste products. This initiative analyzes all scrap materials produced and finds ways to repurpose them as raw material, then reduces waste that cannot be recycling by increasing efficiencies in the production process. Another example is the sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is the most commonly produced industrial chemical in the world. It is used as a catalyst in manufacturing and refinery applications. Once this material is considered spent, we take the waste and regenerate it into fresh acid. So there are a lot of solutions that already exist to fight climate change, but the work is just beginning, beginning for us. And we need to implement the solution we know now find innovative ways to do things smarter and more sustainability and discover or invent solutions to challenges that are yet to be solved. In a wider sense, we are working towards rapidly advancing the circular economy. Thank you, Veronique. That's an impressive uh, set of numbers there. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to uh, come to Natalie now, but I did just want to remind everybody that if you have questions, please put them in the uh, in the chat bar. I'll try and take them as we as we go along. So please please pop your questions uh, in the chat. Um, uh, Natalie, I read somewhere that 130 trillion dollars, or or 40 percent of global assets, are now committed um, to net zero targets. It's an extraordinary uh, figure. Uh, but but tell us a little bit about how important. 
um, green finance or you know green investing is to meeting some of the targets that, that Rachel set out that are being set at a sort of uh, national and international level. Yeah, it seems like with $130 trillion, we solved the problem, right? So why are we still expecting, I think, uh, more damages from extreme weather events? Um, so yes, green finance, and I, I, I hate to call it green finance, let's call it finance. Um, I think as uh, asset owners and asset managers, uh, we are bound to finance the transition to an environment where we can all live, including you know, people in, in developing nations and people in developing mar in developed markets. So this is really part of our quote unquote call to duty. Um, it's also frankly part to preserve our performance over the long term, um, because these risks are very much present as Rachel mentioned through either um, cost of carbon that has gone from 20 euros to close to 90 euros, which is close to $100 or above $100 today, um, or it's to protect uh, our long-term return, not to be exposed to the wrong assets, such as stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry. Um, so, you know, take it however you'd like. I think the realization over the last 10 years has been about this risk on long-term performance, which has driven the mainstreaming of positioning the, the finance industry. And understanding the role, and that's also actually even in the US, the role the private sector, and especially uh, the financial sector, has to has to play um, to to help the planet and and the society move along. And when we say green transition, I really want to insist on the fact that uh, we we have to add another word, which I think is really important, which is the, the just transition. It's understanding that there will be impact. Um, of transitioning our energy system, um, our societies to let, be less um, fossil fuel hungry for growth, um, and in our, you know, um, the developing nations as well. So it's really uh, understanding how this massive transition we're experiencing, um, you know, will impact the different um, stakeholders in the economy. Because uh, sometimes we really much focus on, on what we need to do, but understanding that there are costs associated with that and who is going to finance those costs. Thank you, Natalie. And, uh, you know, are, are you seeing uh, sort of the momentum, you know, if you were to draw a, a graph of, of, of people sort of interested, investors interested in, in green investments, are you seeing that really taking off? Um, you know, for example, if, if I held up two utilities companies, one of which was National Grid, uh, you know, and, and our investors saying, well, look, National Grid, are, they're just as good in a utilities company as, as this company. But look, they've got a they've got a net zero target in 2050. So, you know, we think they, they've sort of seen the future. So we're going to invest in them more than this other company. Are you Absolutely. seeing that sort of um, uh, analysis happening? Absolutely. So um, there, there are some controversial and controversies on, on green finance and what we call environmental, social and, and governance funds. But I won't go into that. Uh, the, the, the point is to identify um, the, the products that are really targeting uh, a positive contribution to uh, the environment. So absolutely, the numbers are staggering. I, I'm going to be also candid. We are 50 years late. Let's put it this way. But the numbers are staggering. So we have you know, growth in uh, ESG and sustainable investment products. So um, investors putting money to work into this solution, this solution providers such um, Veolia and um, the, the grid is, is really staggering. We're talking more than 60 to 80%, depending on um, the product uh, and the capital allocation. And we are currently, if you look at the bonds, so just financing through fixed income and bond issuance for a corporate, we're looking at close to 20% of all issuance of new bonds being uh, green. So it means that they are also uh, labeled, meaning that the, the use of proceeds is very much um, uh, standardized and, and audited, which is important in our business to avoid greenwashing. But yes, we are seeing the appetite for and from end consumers, from you know, retirement accounts, from asset, large asset owners, such as insurers, we're also on the forefront of the bill, right, in terms of the impact. Um, so we're seeing uh, all investors really allocating towards 
call it innovation solution providers, um, and it's also across the board. So um, it's not only in, in developed markets, but also in developing economies where we, we know we understand the need to you know, have innovation in terms of blended finance, partnering with government, local governments to be able to allocate um, into where uh, we think we can have the greatest impact or we can actually help in that transition. Um, so it's happening. What we need, uh, more transparency, more accountability, more uh, standard disclosures by corporate, and yes, backing those um, aspirational goals with um, real numbers. Uh, we are we are in finance a, a data driven industry, so we we um, sometimes shy away when we don't have precision and and uh, clarity. Um, I think this is this is definitely an area where we, we we are going to see massive improvement over the next few years, given the regulatory trends. Even here in the U.S., um, the SEC just announced last year and, and did a consultation on how corporate issuers uh, and if and how how corporate issuers could uh, disclose on their um, climate risk exposure. So we are going to have more data on scope one, scope two, scope three, hopefully more data on. Um, planning for transition, more data on how a carbon price could impact a company. And that's going to be very helpful for the finance industry. Great, thank you. I think you know, accountability, transparency, clarity, standards, regulation, these words have kind of come up uh, time and time again. And I want to go to one of the questions that's come into the, into the chat. It's about greenwashing. Uh, and I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And I'm, I'm not going to put it to any one of you, but I'm going to put it to all three of you. Um, uh, what's your reaction to when people say, yeah, 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 it's all greenwashing? Um, what, how, how does a, you know, a company like National Grid or Veolia or you know, the green finance space come back to charges of, of greenwashing? What's your, what's your answer to that? <laughs> Natalie's just left, so. <laughs> Claire, go I ahead. think Natalie, Natalie did hit the nail on the head, though, like with the importance of data so, and, and transparency, so... Um, any company if you're going to make commitments I think alongside those commitments you then have to commit to being transparent in how you're doing against them and um, for what I'd like it's different for different countries and different sectors in terms of what you can do to to audit that but there are um, reputable organizations that can audit it. So we've signed up to the um, Science Based Targets Initiative, which is a reputable organisation. It's hard work to get your commitments um, approved by them, but there's a level, level of rigour and control that means that um, people can uh, rely on those targets. And I, and I think kind of the point that I made before, you have to be honest as well. So where you are falling behind things, you need to be open about that, and that helps add to the transparency around the reporting. Great, thank you, Claire. Veronique or Natalie, anything to add on um, greenwashing? Yes, as I mentioned by Claire, actually, we, we are reputable companies and uh, we are measured by, by your results, actually. So mentioning concrete examples, how we help our customers actually on their sustainability goals is a concrete result. And I think it's not going washing. I think this is the biggest risk, actually, <laughs> in our industry, because um, we have to be careful between aspiration, and I'm talking here finance, um, but between aspirational goals and, and accountability again. Um, it's not about, you know, we all know that the data and, and understanding the emission, it's a new, it's a new area for a lot of us. Um, so there might be estimates right there. There might be information that are quote unquote, not reliable. It, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't use that. So that's really important, but to be very transparent in terms of the challenges and potentially the, um, the, the issues or the issues around the data. I think the second point, and I'm talking to people in investing here in, in, in these companies, but generally talking to, um, to their uh, managers is, is really to understand and open the hood, um, the products and the investment funds they are exposed to or investing in. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, the, the acronym ESG might be hiding a lot of things and might not be exactly doing what you expected it to do. Um, 
And so, as I said, there's a lot of products who are branding as ESG, which would be targeting, again, companies that are well-managed from an ESG perspective. But when we say that, we say that they are actually put, you know, well-managed for the environmental, social, and governance, governance risks, um, and thus will be performing well because they have taken that into account. It doesn't mean that these companies are necessarily um, contributing to uh, or in investing in um, the transition, call it social transition, the energy transition. It, it might not mean that. So you have to be careful of how an investor is positioning and what is the selection process when investing in these companies. The second part of green or greenwashing or the role of investors is is to engage and vote <laughs> proxies with these companies that are listed. And it means that, I'm, I'm going to be very candid, a portfolio, an investment portfolio doesn't emit emissions. I'm sorry to break that news. It's the corporate and the portfolio holdings and the, the securities that are in that portfolio that are emitting in, you know, directly. And so divesting or disengaging from a high emitter I mean, can feel nice and lower your carbon footprint at the portfolio level, but actually you don't achieve anything. You're just removing the problem from your balance sheet, my investment um, product or my retirement account, but the problem still exists. Um, and so the, I think important role of investors is to engage with these companies and keep them accountable. And I'm sorry to break that news to clear and, and um, uh, here, um, but I think it's important to to keep company accountable through our investor voice, through engagement, um, and and through um, and through proxy voting. I just want to give an anecdote. Um, Exxon Exxon was the largest market cap um, around 2013 in the world, the largest market cap, meaning the most valued company in the world according to. Uh, our standards, uh, meaning through market cap. And uh, it was booted out of major indices, including the S&P 500 in 2020, seven short years, seven years. It's actually that famous cycle, right? Where you see a, 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 a weak signal becoming mainstream in, in seven years. And um, what replaced um, Exxon was Nextera, um, and Tesla, um, not replace one for one, but you see where I'm going, the point I'm trying to make. So um, the world is changing um, and we just need now to make sure that, you know, all of these aspiration goals, I think we all understood the message. I think the, the pressure is going to become even greater over the next few years, either through uh, weather events, uh, not only again in, in uh, countries that are most exposed, but also in our, where we live, uh, we see that in California, we saw that in Germany, um, we saw that in Arizona, in Texas. Um, so this is really important to understand that this is not going away. This is going to be actually more acute um, and in our, our face even more over the next few years. And so we really need to stay true to our, to our commitments uh, and uh, make sure we communicate um, on these targets um, and, and achieve those targets that we set for ourselves. Great, thank you, Natalie. I'm going to uh, bring us to a conclusion now, but I'm going to ask you all one final question. Um, there are a bunch of people um, uh, on the line who uh, work for businesses, own businesses. If you had to give advice uh, to any other business in any sector about how they can do net zero, do it better, do it faster, have more confidence about it, what would you say? What would your advice be? Uh, and Claire, I'm going to start with, with you. What would your advice be? I think make sure you foster the environment for technology and wider innovation, whatever that means in your individual business, because it's it's the bravery in testing the ideas that will push this forward. So we've talked a lot about kind of government policy and directions and things but it, it will be business that step forward and deliver and it will be the you know the bright idea that someone has that will be the game changers in in things moving forward quickly so you need to ensure that you've got the right environment that encourages that and doesn't cycle it 
Thank you. Veronique. Yes, I think the assessment is, uh, is important to really understand what is the goal, what wants, what needs to be achieved, and, and then actually how we can do that. So as I said, actually, it's, there is already a, a lot of existing solutions, but I think collaboration is key actually to innovate to, together. Thank you, and Natalie. Well, let's get it. Let's get it done. <laughs> so, um, yeah, innovation, collaboration. I think that's the key. Uh, we're seeing more, more of that, um, and um, really looking forward to finance the the next decade and and allocate capital towards again this this big transition. I think we we owe it to to our world and and the people who are on this planet. Fantastic. Well, um, I think the future is in pretty good hands. I think lots of really interesting ideas and a level of commitment that we haven't seen really in the last sort of five, 10 years. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you to all our audience members who, who listened uh, and with us throughout this. Thank you to, to Ken, uh, to Michael, uh, to Rachel, who's left us. Um, but a, a very good, um, a very large thanks to Emily Ludovine and Ursula as well, who have worked tirelessly uh, behind the scenes to uh, to make all of this work today. Um, if you do want more information uh, on today's uh, on today's seminar, please go to the Global Business Alliance of New England website, gbane.org, uh, gbane.org, for more information. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one of these. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>